So here's another episode of Tim Rambles On About Wine. Um, but before we get on to our Cabernet trial, I thought it's really important that you guys see some of our previous research. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick, um, primarily just because I'll put it up as a uh, uh, PDF for you in the drive. But I think it'd be good for you to kind of see what we went through before and where we're building up to to uh, see where uh, we went with the trial for the machine harvested uh, versus uh, hand harvested versus crusher to stimmer uh, versus uh, to stimmer crusher. So uh, let's go ahead and go with that. So here's our sort of trial. Uh, this is back to 2013. So this is, you know, that building blocks. You know, every year we learn something, we learn something a little bit more, and we, we just sort of pick up things and, and figure out ways to make uh, better and different wines. So if you guys want to, I'll also post up the May issue of 2014 Wine Business Monthly, The Effect of Optical Sorting on Walla Walla Cabernet Sauvignon. So the reason we did this is why not? Um, I can tell you the story sometime, but basically somebody told me I couldn't do something, so I wanted to prove them that we could. Uh, somebody said that uh, we were a uh, community college and not capable of real research. So, haha. -ha. So at harvest, these are the things that we looked at. We looked at phenolic profiling of the sorted fruit. Um, then after processing, we wanted to look at uh, all of the different basic chemistry. The other thing we wanted to do is scorpion the juice up front to make sure that we had pretty good balanced microbiology going into uh, the experiment. Then after primary fermentation, we did residual sugar, malic acid, chem panels, and phenolic reports. So this was a very intensive setup. This was about $15,000 worth of analysis from ETS. You know the uh, equipment. We had a Delta E2 to stimmer. We had a Dyna clean three meter conveyor to the sorter, uh, our uh, Vitasort prototype, uh, our must pump, and then what we did is we uh, put them into the double walled 36 by 48 one ton fermenters. Our fruit print, uh, processing, we really went over the top of this. We triple randomized it. We had the bins out in the vineyard and we randomized them during harvest. Then we brought the bins down to the crush pad and we, we remixed the bins on the crush pad. And then each trial was then uh, filled randomly into uh, different bins until we had the right weight of fruit. Uh, we didn't add any additions because we didn't want anything up front. Uh, we didn't want anything to mess anything up. So um, we wanted to also check all, all these things. So this is what we what we ran. These are the analyses. Here is the setup back then. Now we realize we can fit the sorter underneath the distimmer. So, uh, but this is the way it was back in 2013. So here's our experimental design. You can look at it pretty quick, but basically all we did is we ran the sorted uh, and randomized it while we were doing it. And then we ran uh, the, uh, pulled the, the sorter out of the way and just put bins under the stimmer and ran the unsorted. And here's a picture of what it looked like. So here's a picture of the sorted uh, versus the unsorted. And then there's a picture of the mod. But what you can't see in the, the matter other than grapes is that it's kind of undulating with all the bugs and things that are in the matter other than grapes. Uh, so there was a lot of that. Uh, that came out. So you can see that there's absolutely not a single jack in the world in the sorted versus the unsorted. We've got a few stems and jacks and things like that. And you know why they're called jacks? Because they look like jacks. You know, the things that you play with, you know, ball, bounce it, grab the jacks, that one. Um, and then there's the matter of the grapes. So let's look at the juice chemistry. We're going to move to do this real fast. So when we look at this on the front end, we did an awesome job of randomizing. These are really, 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 really close in terms of degrees bricks. This is, you know, sampling error of different. Our pH, again, pretty similar. There is a little bit of already elevated pH on the unsorted. And I think that's going to play out a little later on. I think that potassium uh, piece that's uh, the stems and jacks probably contributed a little bit to that. Um, titratable acidity, again, pretty similar. Uh, again, sampling error across the board. So the other thing we want to talk about is the overall losses from the sorting was about 13%. So if you're paying $2,000 a ton, that uh, represents, uh, you know, $260 worth of fruit basically got thrown out. Um, but most of that was because our distimmer is too big and we can't run it slow enough in order to um, be able to run at the right pace of the uh, optical sorter. We now have a variable frequency drive on our distimmer to slow it down enough. So that has changed that. So I think we will be able to, to run it a lot better in the future. Then I wanted to look at juice microbiology. So what happens? Do we have some differences? Because you know, we want to make sure that we're not seeing some you know, reflection of bad microbiology later on. So we ran scorpion uh, spoilage panels, and here's what we looked for. 
And we looked at these and we didn't see much of a change, but what I would like you to look at is in the beginning, we had uh, a few Pediococcus and some Lactobacillus and they seemed to go away. I think they were just sort of uh, dwelling and the sorted one got the first dose of it and then there was none after that. But notice our acetic acid bacteria kind of rise a little bit. And as we pulled out the distimmer and paused it, then went to the unsorted, notice that acetic acid bacteria colony numbers going up. Again, tiny, tiny numbers. But to go from 750 to 1100 to 1200, we just saw that continue to rise all the way through. Gives you an idea how quickly microbiology is actually happening in the, in the cellar. So our effect on microbes was pretty much non, but uh, it was not aseptic, but too small to draw any conclusions, but good enough to scratch your head. Pretty entertaining. So fermentation kinetics, uh, you know, here's some ferment charts. We're going to move through these pretty quick. So again, good old EC triple one eight cat management of two times daily punch downs. And then we uh, brought the N up to 300 parts per million across the board. And then we microoxed uh, twice a daily all the way through. Uh, and here's our ferment charts. So if we take a look at this one, um, here's where we see a change. So when we get to unsorted. Uh, we notice they take a little bit longer to complete. So here we go. Notice that it took a little longer for these to complete. And I think that's really important to notice because um, the unsorted just took longer to, to get through ferment. And I think primarily the reason for that is because the fruit got warmed up on the optical uh, sorter. You've got it out there in the sun. It's getting brought up at a conveyor belt. It's getting heated as it goes across this nice reflective orange surface. And the ferments all were a little warmer to start with. And I think that helped to get to a three-day quicker fermentation. Why that's important is we've noticed some wineries talk about must heat exchangers um, to get ferments going quicker. And when you go, you know, to get some yeast started from 11 degrees centigrade, which is like 51, 52 degrees Fahrenheit, that's really hard place for yeast to start. So if you can get that up to closer to 20, you can get your fermentations to initiate and go a lot faster. And then notice they all completed uh, primary fermentation on the same day. It was perfect. It was pretty amazing. So these are those notations we talked about. We had a little bit more rapid fermentation and warmer fermentation on the unsorted. And that's kind of important note when we start to look at phenolics. So a couple of things to minimize the effect of pressing. Each replicate of the trial was given one barrel and the barrels were filled with free run. So we never even got pressing into the equation. So every one of these trials was simply free run. All right, so let's go to barrels. And we ended up with eight barrels of this. And what we did was totally crazy. I got a bunch of rewind barrels and um, I had them uh, sent to me. Then we tore them apart, randomized the staves and put them back together um, just to make sure we weren't getting any uh, barrel to barrel variability when we got to the sensory piece. Um, now here's things that are interesting. Uh, and this is gonna kind of go along with what we've seen in the STEM trials. And we're seeing this kind of continued trend. But the pH was definitely higher in the unsorted. Um, and we think a lot of that has to do with uh, that idea of uh, some stim inclusion. Uh, and that's given that potassium and raising the pH. Um, and, but also note at this thing, our titratable acidity in the wine is lower in the sorted and higher in the unsorted, yet the pH is backwards. And I think again, that idea that it was carrying more potassium. I wish we'd measured potassium back then on these wines, but we didn't. So uh, just a guess, but I think we've got enough data starting to pile up that that's really uh, giving us uh, a good picture, a clearer picture of that. Um, but what was interesting is the differences in VA is that we had a bit higher on average VA in the unsorted. And I think that's going to come to play when we see a little bit different, but uh, different numbers. But also, uh, interestingly enough, the VA differences are identical to TA. So if you want to click back and forth in the video, I think you'll see that that uh, rises and falls at the same place. Now, here's where we saw a big difference. Um, the unsorted had a lot higher alcohol. And uh, the difference reason why we think that is, is that the sorted simply kicked out all the raisin fruit. And so it ended up being quite a bit lower uh, in initial bricks, whereas um, those raisins don't show up right in the beginning. But as they hydrate, um, we tend to see them start to release uh, their sugar. They give up the sugar a little later on. So we have quite a bit uh, more alcohol. So the uh, unsorted ended up uh, with a little bit more alcohol. So 
pH and wine chemistry, not a whole lot of difference, not too much notability between pH and TA, but it is enough to kind of scratch your head. The VA is definitely different, and the ethanol is a whole lot different uh, between the, the, the sorted and unsorted. Um, and I think the VA is a little bit higher uh, in the unsorted because it's higher alcohol. And when you have higher alcohol, you get higher VA, and they go hand in hand. So pretty cool. Let's get to phenolics. Um, total anthocyanins in the wine. Overall sorting reduced our anthocyanins. We had more in the unsorted. So that leads us to that sort of same sort of idea that we occasionally see with stim inclusion that sometimes, uh, you know, catechin can maybe help to pull anthocyanins in solution. That isn't as clear as we see in other things. Um, the other thing that may have happened is, you know, those raisins may have had higher concentrations of anthocyanins, maybe. Um, but the one thing we definitely see is that uh, a little bit higher anthocyanin concentration in the unsorted. Uh, pyromeric anthocyanins in the wine, we have more in the unsorted. Sorted had less material to begin with, and we're going to end up with less in the wine. Then we get to tannin, and this is where the game totally changes. The amount of tannin is completely different. The sorted fruit was much lighter, much less, uh, pretty significant, 23% on average, less. So less phenolic mass, less phenolic material. And then we look at catechin. Again, replicates really, really close, bunched together, but a lot more catechin in the unsorted. And that makes sense. Essentially, a small amount of stim inclusion. <clears throat> so the catechin tannin ratio, also that seediness uh, ratio, um, you know, to total tannin to catechin. Um, the thing is, is that the unsorted is actually more favorable because there's so much more tannin. Um, so pretty fascinating. So I want to show you this in a, a more of a graphical mat fanner, manner. So if we were to put this on a spider plot and put all of our um, uh, different compounds together and overlay them. This is what the sorted looks like, and this is the unsorted. And the unsorted is just more. Uh, we have more of everything, and we've done this multiple times, and we see this over and over again, that when we sort the fruit, we have highly sorted fruit, you lose a little bit of tannin, you lose a little bit of color, you lose everything. And this is true of Cabernet. Every year we've done it, and um, uh, we see the end up with less. So the only reason you really use an optical sorter is if you have an unruly site where there's so much tannin, there's so much color, there's so much everything that you're making a wine that's uh, got to get lighter and you're you know typically fining in most years to remove some of those compounds. Um, but generally, uh, we kind of want to get as much as we can. So maybe it's not the best thing around. So take home message. When you're performing a trial, only turn one knob. Things that drive me nuts, and I see mistakes happen all the time in the wine industry, is people throw absolutely everything at a wine, and they got an enzyme, they add a tannin, they add an oak, they add a this, they add a that, they the eological product catalog and use four different kinds of yeast, then enhance this and that and everything else, and then the next thing you know, they get to the wine, and they go to drink it, and it's all fucked up, and they ask me why, and I'll be like, I don't know. So if you're going to do a trial, only modify one thing um, and then use that to advance your knowledge. And in the last you know, 10 years of trials and experimentation, we've built an incredible body of knowledge, which is why I'm giving you guys this today. So if you're going to go into your winery and start experimenting, do one tank versus another tank, one thing at a time. Um, sorting doesn't necessarily make a better wine, but it is a phenomenal tool. Adapt, record, and then adapt some more. All right, now I want to talk about how we learned what we used to uh, solve a problem. So we talked about, you guys wanted me to talk about problem solving, advancing, doing a better job, um, and making better wine. So let's look at that. So did this work? Did optically sorting make a better wine? I prefer the sorted to the unsorted, or the sorted. It's a nice summer sipper. That's Paul Greggett. He was the editor-in-chief of the wine enthusiast at the time. And he preferred the sorted wine to the unsorted. 19 to 2, we prefer the unsorted to the sorted, class of 2014. I'd also like to point out, we took this to the wine technical group, 42 out of 45 people preferred the unsorted. And then we also brought this every year to the class until we finally ran out of wine. Every single time, the unsorted was preferred. The bigger, more tannic, more colorful wine was preferred every single time. And we had seven different groups of people look at that. And every time we uh, preferred the unsorted. So I think it's all clear as mud. And so what we wanna do is make the best wine a consumer 
wants. So we want to give the consumer what they want. So here's the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are we can shift those cat and tan ratios. We can shift some things around a little bit. The downside is it slows things down. It's awful. We can run at 15 tons an hour with our Delta E2 cramming Cabernet through. We go to sorting, we, we slow down to two. And we've got a machine that we've got to work on and it's always broken and it drives me nuts. So realistically, unless we absolutely need it, uh, probably not something that we're going to be using uh, unless you know a student really, really wants to use it. So let's look at 2013 versus 2014. So this is what the 2013 fruit looked like coming in when we do fruit phenolic profile. And um, this is what we actually got in the wine. So you can see that we left a whole lot on the table. We left so much on the table because we were trying to be so gentle and just punch down and not get the ferments hot. We didn't extract nearly as much as we could have. We left a lot of material on the table. And so this is Jeff Popick and he's looking at me going, really? I grew you this amazing fruit and you only got 300 milligrams of the amazing 700 milligram a liter tannin fruit I grew for you? Damn it, Timmy, is what he would have said. So uh, things we learned. Uh, skins aren't broken uh, in, in this case, uh, leading to low extract. Um, seed phenolics are needed to add to, to the base to stabilize color. So some, some tannin or something else needs to be there to be added to uh, create those bridges. And we can buy unilogical tannins to do that. Um, and the reason the skins aren't broken is because the sorting process, we don't have a crusher afterwards. So we're going to have to do something about that. Um, but if we look at the shape, the, the sorted is actually more in line with what consumer preference is. So at the end of the day, when you change equipment technology, your winemaking results are going to vary dramatically and you're going to have to adapt. So let's move to the 2014 vintage. Uh, these are the characters that we had work on this particular wine. And their goals, they thought the 2013 was too soft. They liked our 2012, which was unsorted, but it was too green. They want some more body. They want it to be bigger and not harsh. They want a nice, round, fleshy mouthfeel without bitterness. So they wanted a big wine, uh, but they didn't want it as soft as the 2013 that was sorted. So they want a bigger wine. And this is the difference between the fruit and the, uh, you know, the fruit phenolics. So 2013, we had more tannin than we did in 2014. So here we are in a situation where we have a group that wants to make a bigger wine than the year before. They want to use the sorter. And this is kind of how I felt. Well, I suppose that's more apropos. But uh, how am I going to figure out how to accommodate what they want? So how did we evolve? We did a lot of stuff. So this is the case where we did turn all the knobs. We wanted to do everything we could. So we went ahead and sorted it for them because they wanted to. And they, you know, that's what, what we do. We aim to please. We are a custom crush facility. We did a 20% sagne. We bled off juice. We did eight time daily punch downs for the first two days. I worked, worked them hard to break the berries. Uh, we increased our fermentation temperature. Uh, this is before we knew about hot maceration afterwards, but you know, heck, what the heck, we'll give it a try. Um, we uh, used enzymes to break things down. We used oak adjuncts. And then on top of that, um, we went ahead with a little bit longer uh, maceration time to increase polymeric anthocyanin. So we kind of did the everything approach. And so here's our 2013 wine phenolics. And then here's our 2014. And boom, we got it. Um, we kept the shape you know, minimized cannon, uh, lots of anthocyanin, you know, minimized uh, catechin, but had plenty of tannin, plenty of anthocyanins, and total anthocyanins. So we made a bigger wine. And I think that's a result of breaking the berries, hotter fermentation temperature, and probably uh, some, some little bit, especially pushing those polymeric anthocyanins out like that, was oxygen adds and uh, addition of oak. Um, I think that's really cool. And I, now that we know that oak has these aldehydes built in, that's a really good key to add if you're looking to polish up a more rough wine is some oak chips in the, the juice phase to definitely help to build those polymeric anthocyanins. So uh, what changed? Well, here's our anthocyanins, the sorted versus unsorted versus our 2014. We had less going into the equation, but ended up with a lot more in the wine. I think a lot of it had to do with just that more aggressive cap management and enzyme. What else to change? More polymeric anthocyanins. We had too much. And again, remember, they wanted it, uh, the shape right, but they wanted more. Well, we got it. Uh, we also got a little bit more catechin. It's just going to be the way it is. I mean, when you're extracting more of one thing, you get more of the other. But proportionately, it's not that much more.
our tannin. So we went from a very light wine, a 400 milligram a liter Cabernet is like, you know, grocery store Cabernet, to 733 milligram a liter Cabernet, which is really in line with what we're seeing um, now uh, with the vineyard changes and everything else. Uh, even sorting, we still were able to get quite a bit more tannin. So that's pretty exciting. We got into a, a much better, more favorable scenario in terms of tannin. And then that catechin tanner ratio, again, nice and in line. So we just are better off. And that's pretty cool. I didn't do polymeric anthocyanin tanner ratios in this, and I didn't have them back then because I didn't quite understand what they meant. So in seven years, you can see how my knowledge has also increased. So uh, here's the grapes, and this was the tanner from the grapes. And here's what we got in the wine. And I thought this was just really fascinating um, that uh, we ended up with a lot more tannin than we had in the grapes, and that's probably due to Sanye. We have more polymeric anthocyanins, again, oxygen, um, and those oak adjuncts on the front end. And then the total anthocyanins didn't deplete all that much, um, just a little bit from the fruit. And they are labile, so we'd expect that to go down. And probably most of them merged into that polymeric category. So just as a graphic visual, visualization, we definitely got uh, uh, moved the wine. And we talk about how you're going to you know, push wine around. How do you move it? And here's some things you can do. You know, that enzyme and that oak warmth into the, the ferment that get that extract it's pretty cool and at the end of the day we had a happy jeff and that's all we ever wanted from our old buddy and i think he did a hell of a job and uh just a, another great soul that uh i i thoroughly miss and enjoy um and uh yeah that's it so hopefully you learned something feel free to add some comments or send me notes if you guys have any questions